The Screaming Staircase, Chapter 19 Welcome, Mr. Lockwood, welcome! John Williams Fairfax ushered us over to the threshold, shaking Lockwood's hand, nodding curtly to George and me. He seemed even taller and thinner and more mantis-like than I remembered. The cloth of his gray, dark gray suit hung off his wasted limbs in empty folds. Right on time, exactly as you promised, and you will find that I have kept my promise too. I wired the money to your bank account ten minutes ago, Mr. Lockwood, so your company's future is assured. Congratulations. If you will accompany me now to my apartments in the East Wing, you may telephone your bank manager as we discussed. Mr. Cubbins, Miss Carlyle, yonder in the long gallery you will find refreshments laid out by the fire. No, don't bother with your bags. Starkins will see to them. He continued talking loudly as he walked away, his stick tapping on the flagstone floor. Lockwood went with him. George lingered a moment, stomping his boots clean at the entrance mat. Me, I lingered too, but not to clean my boots. For the first time since I was a tiny kid and Jacobs had forced me inside a haunted farmhouse with a stick, I disobeyed the first, most crucial rule. I hung back at the doorway, hesitated and afraid. The lobby of the hall was a great square chamber with a vaulted wooden ceiling and plainly whitewashed walls. George's floor plans had told us it was a relic of the original priory, and in its scale and simplicity, it was still very much like a church. Up on the ceiling, where an ancient crossbeams met, small carved figures gazed in crucibly down, winged and robed, their faces worn away by the years. The walls were hung with oil paintings, mostly portraits of lords and ladies from long ago. On either side of the lobby, recessed arches led to other rooms. Directly opposite me, however, a much larger arch rose almost as high as the ceiling, and beyond that arch... Beyond that arch was a staircase. The steps were broad and made of stone. Time and the feet of centuries had worn them thin at the center, smoothed them sheer as marble. On either side, stone bulstrades swept up toward a quarter landing beneath a circular glass window. Through this, the final rays of sunlight gleamed, splashing the stairs with red. I looked at the staircase, and I couldn't move. I looked at it, and I listened. Beside me, George stomped his feet, his great fat feet. Old Starkins hefted the first devil bag, wheezing and gasping as he thumped it down into the lobby. Footmen walked by, carrying trays of cups, cakes, and clink clinking cutlery. I heard Lockwood laugh as he passed into another room. There was plenty of noise around, in other words, but when I listened, it was something else I heard. A silence. The deeper silence of the house. I sensed it all around me, sentient and aware. The silence stretched away from me, along the corridors and levels up that great stone flight of stairs, through open doors and under lonely windows, on and on, to an ever more frightening distance. There wasn't any end to it. The house was just the gate. The silence continued forever, and it was waiting for us. I could feel it waiting. I had the impression of something towering over me, massive and cliff-like, ready to crash down on my head. George finished stomping his boots. He set off in pursuit of the footmen and their cakes. Starkins wrestled with the luggage. The others were gone. I looked over my shoulder at the gravel driveway and the park beyond. Light drained across the winter countryside, out in the fields, furrows filled with shadow. Soon they'd brim over and flood the land with breeding dark, and the silence in the house would stir. Panic gripped my chest. I didn't have to go in. There was still time to turn back. Nervous, are we? Bert Starkins remarked, shouldering his way past me with a duffel bag in his arms. Don't blame you if you are. That poor little Fitz girl, thirty years back, she was fearful too. Tell you what, I wouldn't blame you if you ran for it. He regarded me with our dour com commiseration. His voice cut through my self-absorption. 
The moment passed. My paralysis was gone. I shook my head dumbly. With slow, slow mechanical steps, I stepped over the threshold, crossed the chilly hallway, and entered the long gallery. This was a darkly beautiful room, lit among its enormous length by a line of mullioned windows. It was clearly the same age as the lobby, the same whitewashed stone, oak ceiling, carved figures in the shadows, rows of darkened paintings. Halfway along, a fire leaped and spat in a vast brick fireplace. At the far end, a faded tapestry filled the wall. It showed a scene of obscure mythological interest involving six cherubs, three plump semi-naked women, and a disreputable-looking bear. Beside the fireplace was a table and the footman setting out high tea. George had already helped himself to a cake, and he was surveying the tapestry with interest. Nice tarts, he said. You should try a custard one. Not now. I need to talk with Lockwood. Good timing. Here he is. Lockwood and Fairfax had entered the room from the lobby. Lockwood moved over to intercept us. His face was calm, but there was a bright gleam in his eye. Have you felt the atmosphere in this place? I began. We... You'll never guess what, he said over me. They've been through our bags. George and I stared. What? While we were walking around with Starkins, Fairfax got his men to check them over. They wanted to make sure we hadn't brought any canisters of Greek fire. George whistled. They can't do that. I know. When we'd given them our word... Over the tea table, Fairfax belabored the footman for some error. He waved an arm, stampered a stick upon the floor. How do you know he did it? I said softly. Oh, he told me straight out after I called the bank. Bold as brass he was, said he'd do the same to anyone. Have to protect the fabric of the ancient building and its highly expensive furniture, blah, blah, blah. But the real message he was giving me was, it's his house, his rules, we play it his way or not at all. It's been like that from the start, George said. This whole thing is screwy. Nothing makes sense. He doesn't allow us to take flares. He gives us no time for research. Then he throws us into what he claims is one of the most haunted sites in Britain. And... It's not just a claim, I said. Can't you feel it all around us? I stared at them. Lockwood nodded curtly. Yes, I feel it. Well, then, you really think we should... Mr. Lockwood? Fairfax's deep voice rolled out across the gallery. Your tea awaits. Come to the table. Let me advise you about the evening. The meal was good. The tea was Pitkin's best and the warmth of the crackling fire drove back the deathly silence for a while. Fairfax sat, at, sat alongside us while we ate, watching us with his black and hooded eyes and talking generalities about the hall. He discussed its many treasures and late medieval ceilings and collections of Sevres porcelain and Queen Anne furniture and the unique Renaissance oils hanging in the lobby and stairs. He told us of the extensive wine cellars running beneath our feet, of the herb gardens which he hoped in due time to restore, of the ruined priory cloisters drowned beneath the lake. He did not mention anything of the relevance to our assignment until the tea was done. Then he dismissed the footman and got down to business. Time presses, he said. And Starkins and I are keen to leave before the lights fail. Now, no doubt, you have your own preparations to make before you can begin your work, so I shall be brief. As I told you the other day, this wing is the afflicted region of the house. Perhaps you have sensed as much already. He waited. Lockwood, who was chasing a raisin around his plate with a lot with his long fin thin fingers, smiled urbanely. It promises to be a very intriguing night, sir, he said. Fairfax chuckled. <laughs> That's the spirit. Very well. Here are the ground rules. As dusk falls, 
I shall shut you in. But be aware that those main doors will remain unlocked all night should you need to leave the building. In addition, on each level you will find an iron door leading to my apartments in the east wing. These will be locked, but in case of an emergency, rap on them loudly and I will come to your aid. Electrical equipment does not work well in the swing, owing to psychic influences, but we will rig up a telephone in the lobby that will connect you to Starkin's cottage. All internal doors will, with one exception, be unlocked, so you can roam where you please. As for that exception, he tapped his jacket pocket, I have the key here and will give it to you per presently. Any questions so far? Uh, it would be useful if you could indicate the areas of most activity, sir, Lockwood said quietly, if you have the time. Yes, yes, of course, Starkins. The old man raised his voice in a roar. From the lobby, the even older man came scuttling and wringing his bony hands. Get Boris and Carlyle to set up the phone, Fairfax said. I'm taking Mr. Lockwood on a tour. He's a good servant, Starkins, he confided. Once the caretaker had bobbed and shuffled away, only hellish timorous wouldn't catch him going upstairs this late, even with the sun still in the sky. Well, I suppose cautions kept him alive this long. Let's get on. We left the table and followed Fairfax out across the room. He indicated a door on the far side of the fireplace. Through there you'll find the garden rooms, reception areas, conservatory, and kitchens. They're old, but not as ancient as this gallery here, which is part of the original priory. It used to lead to other buildings, but... They were pulled down long ago. He pointed to the tapestry at the end. That's where the house ends now. He led us back through the lobby and over to an archway beyond. Here was a square carpeted room made dark by rows of towering bookshelves. On the far side was a studded metal door. Uncomfortable looking modern chairs of iron and leather stood among reading tables. On or one wall was almost covered by a large collection of framed photographs, some in color, most in black and white. The largest of all, right in the center, showed a serious, serious young man in doublet ruff and tights, scrutinizing a moldy-looking skull. Lockwood regarded it with interest. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir, but isn't that you? Fairfax nodded. Yes, that's me. I played Hamlet in my youth. Indeed, I played most Shakespearean roles, but the Dane was perhaps my favorite. Ah, to be or not to be, the hero caught suspended between life and death. If I may say so myself, I was rather good. So then, this is the library where I spend most time during my visits. My predecessor's tastes in books were as poor, so I've replaced his with my own collection of refurbished it a little. It is just a step through the door there to the safety of my chambers, and the iron furniture, made by my own company, of course, keeps the ghosts away. A very pleasant room, if I may say so, Lockwood comment commented. You won't spend much time here during your search, Fairfax returned to his, as to the lobby, where Starkins was setting a black, old-fashioned telephone on a side table, beside an ornament vase. The source, whatever it is, it doubtless is the oldest portion of the house, the lobby, the long gallery, or most probably upstairs. Hey, careful there! Two footmen were unraveling a coil of telephone wire around the table. The Tan Dynasty. Do you know the value of that vase? He continued to rebuke them, but I had turned, tuned him out. I walked across the lobby listening with my inner ear, hearing only my heart beating in the waiting silence. 
Ahead of me, the great stairs rose, curving to the quarter landing and onward into darkness. Strange creatures with lots of scales and horns were carved into the sides of the bolstrade. Every other step, each supported a small plinth between its claws. Hear anything? George murmured. He drifted alongside me. No, the reverse. It's like it's cloaked or something. I see you found the legendary screaming staircase. Fairfax was back with us once more. See those plinths beside the carven, dra carven dragons? Those are where the Red Duke set the skulls of his victims, or so the story goes. Perhaps after tonight you will be able to confirm the story of the stairs. I hope for your sake you do not hear it scream. He led the way up the flight, sticking earth, t stick tapping on the stone. We followed in a silent, ragged procession, each ignoring the others, letting our senses take the lead. I let my fingers run across the hard rails. Handrails opening, my mind to psychic traces, listening all the time. We crossed below the window, four slow figures stained with the sun's last rays, climbed another flight, and arrived at a landing. A deep burgundy carpet and flocked red wallpaper absorbed all sounds. There was a strange sweet smell up here, like tropical flowers, heavy with the taint of decay. A long, wide corridor that I remembered from George's plans ran east-west, following the line of the house. Numerous rooms opened on both sides. Through half-open doors, I glimpsed dark-toned furniture, paintings, heavy golden mirrors. Fairfax ignored them all. He led the way west along the corridor until it ended in a door. Fairfax halted. Whether it was the effort of the stairs or the suddenly stifling quality of the air, he was out of breath. Beyond this barrier, he said finally, is the place I told you of, the Red Room. It was a sturdy wooden door, closed and locked, and no different from the others we passed, except for the mark upon it. Someone, at some time, had slashed a great rough X upon its central panel. One stroke was short, the other long. Both were made with violence, scored deep into the wood. Fairfax adjusted the position of his stick upon the floor. Now, Mr. Lockwood, pay close attention. Because of its particular danger, this room is always kept locked. However, I have the key here, and I hereby transfer it to your possession. He made a great show of it, patting and rummaging. Finally, the key appeared, a small gold thing on a loop of dark red ribbon. Lockwood took it coolly. It is my belief, Fairfax said, that the source is in that room. Whether you decide to pursue it is a matter for yourselves. You do not have to enter. I leave it up to you. I think you can already sense, however that I am right. He may have said more, but I was too busy trying to block out the faint, insistent whispering sounds that had suddenly broken through the silence. They were somewhere very close, and I did not like the voices. I noticed that Lockwood had gone ashen, and even George looked green and queasy. He'd drawn his collar high about his neck, as if he felt the cold. Down in the lobby, the telephone had been rigged up beside the vase, its cable running across the stones on a socket somewhere in the library. The footman had gone. Old Burke Starkins jittered by the doors, silhouetted in the half-dark, desperate to follow them. Ten minutes, sir, he cried. Fairfax regarded us. Mr. Lockwood? Lockwood nodded. That's fine. Ten minutes is all we need. We worked in silence, beneath the high, thin windows of the long gallery, emptying out our bags, collecting the equipment, tightening straps, and adjusting gear. Each of us had our usual tools, plus a few extra, to make up for the lack of flares. 
At my belt, I carried my rapier, a flashlight, and extra batteries, three candles with a lighter and a box of matches, five small silver seals, each of a different shape, three sashes of iron filings, three salt bombs, two flasks of lavender water, my thermometer, my notebook, and pen. Next, on a separate strap, looped like a sash across my so so shoulder, I had two lines of plastic canisters arranged in pairs. Each pair contained half a pound of iron filings and half a pound of salt. Next, over my other shoulder, I had a loop of slender iron chain, six feet long when fully unfurled, and tightly around wound with bubble wrap to prevent excessive noise. Last, in an outer pocket of my coat, I kept a pack of emergency provisions, energy drink, sandwiches, and chocolate. Our thermoses, flasks of good hot tea, and the larger chains and seals were carried in a separate bag. In addition to my normal clothes, I wore thermal gloves, a thermal vest, and leggings, and thick socks under my boots. It wasn't cold enough yet for my hat, so I stuffed this into my pocket of my parka, and I still had the necklace in its silver glass case hidden around my neck. The others were outfitted more or less the same, though Lockwood also had his dark glasses clipped to the breast pocket of his coat. The equipment weighed us down and was more cumbersome than usual, but we each carried enough iron to be individually self-reliant. If we were separated and the need came, we could set up our own circles of defense. The duffel bag still contained double sets of two-inch iron chains, which even the strongest visitor would find pretty hard to move, but we weren't wholly dependent on those now. We finished. The light outside the windows was almost gone. Over the fireplace, the orange flames danced low. Darkness crept along the ceiling of the long gallery and weltered into the crooks and angles of the great stone staircase. But so, what if it did? Yes, the day was dead and the night had come, and the visitors of the hall were stirring. But Lockwood and company were ready. We worked together, and we wouldn't be afraid. Well, that's it, Fairfax said. He stood beside Starkins at the door. I shall re-enter here at nine tomorrow morning to receive your report. Are there any final questions? He gazed around at us. We stood there waiting. Lockwood, smiling softly in the way that he had, hand resting on his rapier, seemingly as relaxed as if he was lining up for a cab. Beside him, George was awkwardly impassive, as ever, Blinking through his thick round specks, his pants hitched high against the weight of salt and iron. And me? How did I look? I wonder. In those final moments? I hope I carried myself well. Hope I didn't let the fear show. Any questions? Fairfax repeated. Each of us stood there quietly, waiting for him to shut his trap and go. Until the morning, then. Fairfax raised his hand in ponderous farewell. Good luck to you all. He nodded crisply to Bert Starkins and turned to descend the steps. Starkins reached out to close the doors. Twin squeals of hinges, the doors swung in. For a moment, the caretaker's body was framed between them, silhouetted against the twilight like a gaunt and twisted gallows tree. Then the doors slammed shut. The reverberation of their closing rang sharply around the lobby and away along the galleries. I could hear the echoes drifting on and on into the dusty reaches of the house. Wouldn't it be good if he had got if he'd forgotten his stick, George said, and he'd have to scurry back in again to pick it up? That would be absolutely ruin the effect, wouldn't it? Neither of us answered. The echoes had faded, and now the eager silence of the house rose to enfold us like the waters of a well.